Hello and welcome to this session in which we will discuss finance lease specifically from the lessor's perspective. In the prior session, we also looked at finance lease, but we looked from a lessee's perspective. Remember, the lessor is the, in quote, the owner of the asset. The lessee is the renter of the asset, the one that's using the asset. Here's the good news. To classify a lease under a finance lease, whether you're a lessee or a lessor, the classification tests are the same. They're identical. So that's the good news. So whatever we learned in the lessee accounting finance, it applies to the lessor. So the classification test, which is remember there are five of them, I will briefly review them, are identical to that of the lessee to determine the classification of the lease, whether that lease is a finance lease or an operating lease, which is we're going to be dealing with finance leases in this session. In the next session, we'd look at operating lease. So when we have a finance lease for the lessor, we're going to consider this as a sales type lease. So when I say finance lease, sales lease or sales type lease, it's the same thing. Because when it's a finance lease, as if the owner is selling the asset to the renter. Now, how do we know if the owner is selling the asset to the renter? What if the, if the lessor, if the owner, in substance, in essence, transferred control. Now, we're going to see what does it mean, how do you interpret transfer control of the right of the use of the asset. Then guess what? The lessor has a sales type lease. It means the lessee took ownership or consumed a substantial portion of the underlying asset. If that's not the case, if the lessor, in essence or in substance, does not transfer ownership, which is gives control to the lessee, or the lessee consume a substantial portion of the asset, then we have at our hand an operating lease. Now, how do we how do we determine this transfer of control? Well, remember the five tests that we go through. This is a review. First, we have to have a non-cancelable -can agreement. We have to have a, a legitimate agreement, of course, because no contract without an agreement for leases will really exist. Then we have test of ownership test. Does the transfer of ownership occur at the end of the lease? If the answer is no, you don't have a finance lease. Purchase option. Do we have a purchase option on that lease? And specifically, when we talk about a purchase option, it has to be a bargain purchase option, enticing enough to let the lessee buy the asset. If the answer is no, we don't have a finance lease. Is the lease term equal to 75% of the economic life of the lease property, 75% or more? If the answer is no, you don't have a finance lease. Present value of the lease payment equal to or greater than 90% of the asset. The asset that we're going to be working with is the ladder. That's why I call it ladder, but it's an asset. If the answer is no, that's not the case. We don't have a finance lease. Is there an alternative use test? If there is no alternative use test, in other words, we leased something, we leased an asset, a ladder, and that ladder is so specialized to that company, technically we sold it for them. So if... So we have to pass the alternative use test. Let's assume there's no alternative use test, then we have a finance lease. So here, just for the sake of illustration, remember, no alternative use. It means the asset is not useful for the lessor. They can do anything with it when they get it back. Technically, the lessee bought it, therefore we have a finance lease. So notice for all these no's, they fail the finance lease, but this no will give you a finance lease. Now, if this answer was yes, and the, all the others were no, then we have an operating lease because it did not pass the test. Accounting of, for sales lease is simple. If it's a sales lease, remember, what do you do when you sell an asset and you sell it on account? You have a receivable. So the lessor account for the lease in a manner similar to an asset sale. What does that mean? It means I'm going to have a receivable. Specifically, I'm going to have a lease receivable. Nevertheless, it's a receivable. And since I sell the asset, I'm going to remove the asset. So simply put, I'm going to debit AR, basically simple accounting, credit sales, debit cost of goods sold, credit the asset inventory. Okay, this is basically when you sell using perpetual inventory system. This is the entry that you make. Now the AR is called a lease AR and the asset and the inventory is really a particular asset, but the concept is the same. Now, how do we capitalize lease receivable? So this amount lease receivable, what is it equal to when we debit lease receivable? What does it equal to? It's gonna equal to the present value of the payment received. Remember, the lease would involve a series of payment. Remember, when you lease something, the the person, the lessee that you leased it to, will give you payments. Well, the lease receivable, you have to find the present value of those payments plus. 
So notice here plus for the lessor, you also have to find the present value of the residual value. So when it comes to the lessor, and we'll talk about the residual value later on in a separate session, the lessor would always find the present value of the residual value to compute to compute the lease receivable, whether that residual value is guaranteed or not. So this is what's this is how we record the lease receivable: the present value of the payment plus the present value of the guaranteed or unguaranteed residual value. And the best way to illustrate this is to take a look at an example. We're going to take a look at the same example. S slight changes, slight change change it slightly, but basically the same example that we looked for the lessee. Assume that Boeing Capital, which is a subsidiary of Boeing Company, and Delta Airlines signs a lease agreement dated January 1st, X1, that calls for Boeing to lease a mobile airplane ladder, we're going to call it ladder, to Delta beginning January 1st, X1. So we have two parties, Boeing and Delta Airlines. Now we're going to go over this example and show you the details of it, which we saw on the prior in the prior session. Before we do that, most likely if you're watching, you are an accounting student or a CPA candidate. If that's the case, great, you have arrived. Please go to farhatlectures.com. I can help you. The reason you are watching because you found me on YouTube and you're looking for some help. Go a step further. Go to farhatlectures.com. Subscribe. I can give you additional information. I don't replace your CPA review course. I'm a supplemental tool to your CPA review course. I give you access to lectures, multiple choice, true, false exercises. That's going to help you understand your accounting courses. That's going to help you understand your material, your your leases, your bonds, your CPA material better. If you have not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so. Take a look at my LinkedIn recommendation. Please click on the like button on this video. If you're liking it, like it. Why not? It doesn't cost you anything. It helps me and it helps others. Connect with me on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. So here are the details for the deal between Delta and Boeing. The term of the lease is five years. It's non-cancellable. You always have to have it non-cancellable. Otherwise, it's if you, if you have a, an agreement where either party can walk away with no penalties, no stiff penalties, then it's not really a deal. It's requiring equal rental payment of 20000 Now, although it's I told you it's $20,000, i am going to show you how to compute this payment in this example because it's important that you know how to do so. The fair value of the ladder is 95000 Now, the fair value is important here. The fair value of the ladder is 95000 It means if they want to sell it today, they would sell it for 95000 with an estimated economic life of five years. So notice, five-year economic life, five-year lease, it met one of the lease, it met one of the lease, uh, it met one of the lease uh, requirement, which is 75%, greater than 75% of its economic life here. The lease is 100% of the economic life. We have a finance lease. The expected residual value after five years is 2,926. And you're going to see why I made this number so. There's no renewal option. Uh, the ladder would revert back to Boeing at the termination of the lease. That's fine. Delta incremental borrowing rate is 5%. Boeing sets an annual rate of 4% per year, and we know this rate. And the collectability of payment by Boeing is assured. Remember, we are doing accounting for the lessor, so it's very important to understand that if the collectability is not assured, not probable, you really don't have an agreement, you don't have a sale, because think about it. It's easy to lease things to anyone. Why? Just tell them. You could find someone deadbeat, say, okay, I'm going to lease you this. But if they cannot pay you, you didn't really do any good. Well, because anybody will take your asset and use your asset. But you want to make sure that this this party, you can collect from them. Collectability is assured. Now, the cost of the ladder for Boeing is $80,000. This is giving because we need to compute the cost of goods sold. So this is the information that we are giving. And we already we already know that this is a finance lease because the economic life, the lease term and the economic life are 100%. So the first thing I'm going to show you how to compute the payment, although I gave you the payment of 20,000. But here's what you do. You will take at the you will take the fair value of the leased asset 95,000. Then you deduct from it, you deduct from it less the present value of the residual value, which is the residual value is 2,926. You multiply it by the present value factor, and this is n equal to n equal to 4%. I'm sorry, n equal i equal to 4, the interest rate is 4, n equal to 5, 5 periods. And this is the present value factor. So the present value of the residual value is $2,405. You will take a look at the fair value minus the present value of the residual value. Now, why are we doing so to find the payment? Because the payments that the lessee pays should be the payment amount received by the lessor for the leased payment. So those are the payments that cover your lease. 
that cover your lease. Okay, the residual value that asset is 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 given back to you. So you don't have to cover the payment from that. You have to cover the payment for the lease payment. Therefore, they should be ninety two thousand five ninety five in total. Now, what you do is you you have to find the payment. You will take this amount. You divide this amount by the present value factor of an annuity due, which is four point six two nine nine zero. I keep mentioning those, you know, those decimals like 0.82 and here there is no decimal it's a present value factor if you're not familiar with what i'm coming where, where this is coming from please go to farhat lectures and look at my time value of money if you're doing leases you need to be very familiar and comfortable with the present value of money so i'm not going to cover this here i have five to six lessons explaining the concept never nevertheless you will take the amount to be received by the lessor from the lessee payment and you'll divide it by the present value factor of an annuity due why annuity due in this example because the first payment was due immediately january 1st x1 which is this happens to be the factor and if you do so you're going to come with approximately 19,998 point something you round it to 20,000. so this is how we came up with the payment this is how we came up with the payment so this is the payment sometime it's giving i gave it to you and i showed you how to compute this now let's go back to our lease receivable how would our lease receivable looks like it's equal to ninety-five thousand. it's composed of the payments to be received from the payment plus the guarantee residual value which is the present value of those notice those together those together will equal to the lease receivable which is the fair value so the fair value is the lease receivable Let's debit the, the lease receivable. Let's put the lease receivable on the books of 95,000. Credit sales, 95,000. And I told you cost of goods sold. The cost of the ladder for Boeing happens to be 80, which, which was giving. And credit inventory or credit the ladder or the asset for 80,000. So this is the entry that Boeing makes on January 1st, 20X1. And by doing so, notice they made a profit of 15,000 because they, on the income statement, a sales of 95,000 is recorded, a cost of goods sold of 80, they have a profit of 15,000. Now, obviously, they're going to make more profit from the interest on the deal, but this is the profit that they make on the sale. It's the profit that they make on the sale. Now, they're going to have to prepare an amortization schedule with the annual lease annual lease payment that they would receive interest on the receivable reduction of the receivable and the lease receivable the lease receivable we already know starting at ninety five thousand. immediately delta Airlines signs a check for twenty thousand so well if they signs the check immediately immediately the check would reduce the amount of ninety five to seventy five thousand. it's a reduction in the lease receivable because they signed the check on the same day there's no interest component to that payment well boeing will debit cash credit lease receivable then we're going to have to compute the interest. A year later, Delta will make a payment of 20000 Now, Boeing will have to determine how much of that payment goes toward the lease, how much of that payment goes toward the interest on the, uh, on the lease. Well, the lease is 75000 The interest rate is 4%. We'll take 75000 times 4%, and that's going to give us an interest of 3000 so first you compute the interest component and the interest is based on the lease receivable times the interest rate which is 3000 so of the payment of 20000 we're going to say 3000 is interest revenue okay we're going to and this is and this entry we make on december 31st and that's why we debit lease receivable because the payment is received january 1st so this is december 31st 20 x1 to accrue the interest so of the 20,000 we allocate three to the interest and obviously the remainder would be allocated to the lease receivable it's to the lease receivable itself which in turn will lower the lease receivable to 58,000 then the process would repeat itself then we'll make another payment we'll we'll we're gonna have to make another payment on january 1st 20 x2 well, on December 31st, 20X1, we're going to have to debit lease receivable, 2320 uh, and credit interest revenue. Now, let's see what the balance sheet would look like as of December 31st, 20X1. Well, here we go. We're going to have a lease receivable of 3000 which is this lease receivable, which is the interest component. Plus, we're going to have a lease receivable that we have to pay soon, the following day of 17000 Therefore, under current assets, we're going to have a lease receivable in total of 20000 And the remaining of the leased asset, which is non-current asset, it's, it's a form of an investment, if the, if the 58000 So we're going to have a current asset, 
plus a non-current asset presented. What we will show on the income statement. On the income statement, we are going to show three things. We're going to show the sales of 95,000, less cost of goods sold of 80,000, plus we're going to show the 3,000 of interest revenue that we recorded on December 31st, 20X1 to accrue the interest. So this is how we show things on the income statement. Now on January 1st, January 1st, 20X2, we're going to receive the cash. We debit cash and credit the lease receivable for 20,000. So the, the lease receivable consists of 3,000 interest, which we already computed as interest revenue, and 17,000 reduction of the principal, which already being reflected in this entry. Okay. So that's the January 1st X1. Now, again, if we want to do another accrue, accrue another interest, the December 31st 20 X2. So December, December 31st 20 X2. Again, we will accrue interest revenue of 2,332, which is this amount here. Then the following day, we'll do the same thing. We, and notice interest revenue went down because the lease receivable went down and the process would repeat itself year after year. So if you can, if you can, if you can work the first two, three years, then you can do, actually, if you can do two years, you can do an amortization schedule of 20 years. That's all the same. So make sure you know how to read this. So after we make the payment, the sec, the third payment, the interest is 2320, the principal is 17,680. The principal goes down to 40,320, which is the lease receivable. Then we compute the interest again based on the new lease receivable. The interest revenue is lower. The 20,000 goes to the interest revenue, the remaining to the lease receivable, so on and so forth. Now we're not done yet because notice at the end of the lease, it has to go down to zero. At the end of the lease, what's gonna happen? We're gonna have January 1st, 20X6, at the end of the lease, we're going to have an interest component of $115.89, which is this amount times 4%. And we're going to have to remember we're going to get back the inventory. Boeing, we means Boeing. Boeing is going to get back the inventory. Remember, the inventory would revert back to Boeing. So when you give them back physically the ladder, they're going to debit inventory, 2926, and remove the lease receivable. Therefore, we end up with a lease receivable of zero. So this is the how, how you would process the entries and this is how the amortization schedule will show for the lessor. What should you do now? Go to farhatlectures.com, work, MCQs, true, false, look at exercises, look at additional resources because you need to learn a little bit more. Invest in yourself. Don't shortchange yourself. Accounting is important. If you're studying for your CPA exam, it's a long-term investment. Good luck, study hard, and of course, stay safe.